Hi, my name is Gordy Hogue, and this is Community Connection. Each of us have stories, stories that help us understand each other and help to bring our community closer together. I have been very fortunate to have met many interesting people. People who've had a positive, profound impact on our community and far beyond. People who've had incredible life experiences and fascinating stories. Community Connections is about these people and about their stories. I'm sure you'll enjoy meeting these amazing people as much as I have. Thank you. Please enjoy. Hi, my name is Gordy Hogue and this is Community Connections. And I'm delighted to have our guest today, Gary Z. Welcome, Gary. Welcome to Community Connections. Thanks for having me, Gordy. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Can you tell a little bit about uh, your your life growing up and how you ended up in Canada and the things you've been doing to, to get here? Sure. So uh, I was born in Guangzhou in China, and then I immigrated to Canada with my family um, when I was nine years old. We first landed in East Van, and I did my elementary schools over there. And then I moved again when I was going to high school. Um, and then I started grade eight in semi, um, finished over here, uh, and then left for the United States for uh, my undergrad. So your your mom and dad made a decision that it was wanting to have you and your sister come to, to Canada and to learn and to be educated here. Was that a tough decision or a family decision that was made along the way? Well, actually, when we first came over, we just wanted to um, travel a bit. Uh, yeah. We got our immigration visa at that time, but we still haven't really made up our mind if we wanted to, you know, leave all our family behind. Mm -hmm. um, and so we we came over and it was supposed to be a one week where we would just explore Canada uh, a bit more. And then we just liked Canada a lot. And at that time, I, I had um, a bit of health issues. Um, I had asthma and I was just feeling a lot better in Canada. Mm -hmm. So uh, we ended up throwing away our return ticket. <laughs> uh, and just stay there here. So that must have been, a, I guess it was an easy decision in the end, but certainly having to leave your family and, uh, and living here must have been a, a difficult call at that point. Definitely. I think especially for my parents, because yeah. me and my sister, we were, um, we were young and we were able to go anywhere. But then I think particularly for my mom, it was a really tough decision. So what was East Vancouver going to elementary school there like? And in that community well so i i just remember that um well at that time i i didn't really speak english that well so my um entire experience was just trying to uh, uh, get to know the community a bit more um, but one thing i did realize after coming over uh, to south surrey for high school was that the community here in south surrey is just much more um, tightly knit together because uh, in East Van, yeah, you have neighbors, but you don't really have a lot of interactions with them. Um, but then in South Surrey, it's more common for people to say hi to you on the streets. And I found that really um, liberating, actually. And then you came to Semiamu, came to South Surrey and, and went to Semiamu and uh, the International Baccalaureate Program. I and, did. And talk, talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, so the IB program, International Baccalaureate program, is two years. So you do it on your, your grade 11, grade 12 years. Uh, and it's supposed to be uh, college level courses. Um, I had a, it, was, it was a tough transition from uh, you know, the regular curriculum in, over to the International Baccalaureate, um, especially since at that time I was still doing a lot of applications for uh, you know, schools and then I was preparing for my exams and all of that. Uh, so it was probably a very intense two years. And you got involved in a number of activities other than just education while you were there. I did, yeah. So in grade 10, um, I, I heard from one of my teachers about this program called Forum for Young Canadians. Um, it's a one week long program for high school students in Ottawa where you kind of get to engage with the political process and understand how the government works a bit. Um, so. That's how I, how I actually first got into contact with you, because uh, I, I was going around the neighborhood asking for sponsorships. Um, I got some money from Boston Pizza. They were, they were very nice to give me a voucher that I could, I could sell. I went to the 
Canadian Legion as well. Um, and then I went to the uh, Liberal Party and a, a couple of other other organizations. And then I I I was I think I was walking home from the Legion um, when I saw your office and not knowing a lot about about you or you know what MLAs do. I walked in and I struck a conversation with Verna, um, and then we just we just talked a bit. Um, and I and at that time, Verna gave me a um, Olympic pin for me to bring to uh, Ottawa, and that that was the first time that um, I I knew you. And then you got a little involved in the political process with respect to all candidates meeting and and really being engaged in meaningful ways. Can you talk about how that started and? how that has evolved for you? Yeah, so I think um, my time at Ottawa with the Forum for Young Canadians really, um, you know, got me really interested in the political process. So um, in 2013, when we had a provincial election, um, I, I saw that, you know, there's a lot of candidate debates going on uh, with the um, Chamber of Commerce and, and other organizations, but I didn't see a lot centered around youth. Um, and I feel like, uh, you know, a lot of uh, my friends at SEMI uh, were kind of like me, who are interested uh, in the political process, but know very vaguely about it. And so I decided to organize a, a all candidates debate just for uh, the young students. Um, so we invited you and, and um, your, your challengers, uh, and we had, a, we had a really good debate. And I, I remember at that time there were you only attended three debates uh, in the community. One was the Chamber of Commerce, and another one was um, was also centered around the community. And and this was the only youth event you you attended as well. I think that was a big encouragement for a lot of people to to kind of, uh, especially students who who got to know you the first time. Is is there something that uh, in your observations of getting involved in this democratic process, is there some things that uh, you think that governments or candidates could be doing better in terms of being able to engage and reach out and to be involved in the community? Yeah, I, I feel like, definitely, I, I feel like um, it's really about how the communication is done because uh, I think, you know, two issues. First, a lot of the things that young younger students or the younger generation care about might not be the same as what candidates are used to talking about. Um, for example, candidates who talk about, you know, um, you know, big national st stuff. That's very interesting for the younger generation, but, but also younger generation also want to um, know about things in their community and that, that they're, they're caring about. Um, and so, you know, really understanding um, what are some of the issues that younger generations care about. That, that's, a, that's a big thing. And then another one is definitely terminology because uh, a lot of younger people might be turned off if you kind of throw around big words. Um, and so knowing how to, how to really engage um, and talk about an issue at a, at a, at a level with them, uh, it's very important. And do you think that that's being done as well as it could be? Or are there some other ways that engaging younger people? Because certainly the research shows that the earlier people get involved, in the democratic process, the more likely they are to continue with it and continue to participate and vote. So I think the comments you're making are very salient and important. Yeah, um, I think Justin Trudeau did a good job at, at it, um, at least when he was running for the leader of the Liberal Party. And that's why if you, if you look at data, I think young people, younger generation voted disproportionately for him. Um, I, I think that there has been a, better shift from, you know, when I was involved uh, in, in 2013, uh, that people are beginning to talk a lot more about, um, you know, the younger generation. So it's, a, it's an encouraging trend, but I think it, it still needs to, you know, continue to improve. And then you went off to Georgetown. I did. And can you talk about that experience and uh, you studying economics and was it macroeconomics, microeconomics, or all kinds of economics? And what was that experience like moving from, from Canada and British Columbia to George to University of Georgetown? Yeah, so I was talking to Doug about this, um, saying that how I just 
wanted to leave home uh, and leave my parents behind as, as much as possible. And so I, I didn't even apply to a lot of any of the West Coast schools. And I, I knew that I wanted to go to the East Coast to explore. Um, and so it was a it was it was a big change for me, but I, I had a lot of American friends who wanted to ask me uh, if there if I felt a big difference between uh, you know Canada versus the U.S. And I think that yeah, there's a big difference, but the difference is not really north to south where you you see the difference in the two countries. It's it's more coast to coast, where whereas the West Coast has a, a set of values and and um, you know, set of behaviors versus the East Coast. East Coast people tend to be more, um, you know, less um, less friendlier, I would say, <laughs> than people on the West Coast. Um, I my favorite anecdote was that I I got so used to petting people's dogs on the street <laughs> when I was walking around in South Surrey, and then when I did that in uh, Washington DC, it was seen as you know, quite creepy and people didn't know how to respond to that. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting comment. So uh, you spent, you got your undergraduate degree there and uh, you did some work around energy and renewable energy and the issues around that. Can you talk a little bit about that and the work you did in that? I think you had a paper published through that process too. I did, thanks to you. Um, so I, I got an opportunity to work at OECD in Paris um, and then, we were interested in looking at the environmental uh, environmental economics, and specifically, we we started looking at British Columbia because we are the first jurisdiction in North America that instituted a carbon tax. Mm -hmm. And despite what a lot of people have been saying about uh, you know the carbon tax might might take a huge toll on the economy, if you look at British Columbia, we've been growing quite well uh, since 2008. And so a lot of my my bosses who who are Europeans. Um, we're kind of interested in how to tell this narrative. And so we we're looking at data in, in British Columbia uh, to explain this, this overall growth despite or probably because of the carbon tax. Um, and then later we started looking at renewable energy trades, uh, especially with wind energy uh, equipments that became quite big in Canada. So what were the conclusions of your... Uh of your paper and what were the, what did you come to in terms of being able to inform other jurisdictions with respect to that experience? Were you making some recommendations? Yeah, so I, I think the main recommendation we, we got was that um, you know, in North America, there's still this narrative where economic uh, considerations and environmental considerations might be, um, might, might be a zero sum game, meaning that you, you either, you know, uh, you either tailor to uh, cater to economic growth or you protect the environment and and you're kind of there's kind of a trade off between them but then what we found in British Columbia was that a lot of times uh, environmental regulations can lead to technological improvements because it's now more costly to pollute than companies that adopt cleaner measures and that in the end actually helps with economic development because because um, if you look at productivity growth, uh, a lot of it's driven by technological uh, advance, advances. And so if you're able to push for that with your uh, policy, then that's where the productivity comes from. Did you get any response to your, your paper and did the countries in, in the OECD express some interest in it? Uh, did you see any follow-up or anybody that learned from that? Yeah, so we, we had a um, discussion within the uh, trade and agricultural working group within the OECD. And I think most countries are, are were pretty happy about that. Um, the Australian delegation had, had a little problem with uh, our data uh, because we kind of cited Australian data um, and all of that, but then it, it was resolved in the end. They, they weren't happy about how we presented um, how Australia, since they're really big on, on energy and, and uh, things, then they, they, they were not happy with how we kind of told a narrative about their economic growth. So uh, just in case people don't know, OECD stands for the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And uh, it has a pretty robust reputation around the world in terms of the information it provides and, and leads us to that. So you, uh, when you graduated from, uh, from Georgetown, you 
on to take a, a master's degree at the Univers uh, University of Beijing. And that's right. obviously that's been set aside a little bit during the pandemic, but what, what, uh, what is your thesis gonna tell us? What are you gonna learn as a result of a master's degree now? Yeah, so I, I think it was a big decision for me to go to Beijing. A lot of my professors were telling me that this might be a very risky move uh, just because of the political tensions between China and, and America at that time, uh, but also because um, you know it, 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 economics is just taught differently uh, in different parts of the world. But I think I really wanted to go to Beijing because number one, you know, Vancouver has such a close connection um, with the Asia Pacific, and number two, as a student of environmental economics, China is such a big player uh, because it's not only the biggest you know polluter, but it's also a country that has has a lot of technological innovation that's driving a lot of these clean worlds. Um, so when I went over, I, um, I did a lot of uh, things with development economics and looking at how China was, was developing its economy, uh, but also uh, driving you know, growth in renewable energy and also uh, having urban planning where you really emphasize um, the renewable and uh, sustainable components of it. What do you think are the most important lessons Canada can learn from your experience and from China's experience with respect to looking at sustainable development? I think China does does well with industrial policy, uh, you know, supporting our, our industries. Um, and a lot of people are very uh, sensitive about the word industrial policy because it, it kind of um, suggest a, a, a threat to free market where you're not le letting market do the allocation and you're getting the government to choose winners and losers. But if you look at, you know, all the economies around the world, uh, America has a big industrial policy. Um, Japan, certainly, um, its post-war growth was driven a lot by um, the industrial policy made by its, um, its Ministry of Industry and International Trade. Um, and I think that with with Canada right now, uh, especially as we are, um, you know, a lot of our, our industries are, are transitioning right now um, with the global reposition and, uh, you know, globalization where, where, where you know, um, manufacturing jobs are shifting, then it's really important to adopt um, industrial policy to help with our sustainable sectors. You're going to have to write a thesis for your master's degree, I assume. Uh, yes. What is that? What's the subject matter of your master's degree going to be? Well, it's still changing. I think right now, uh, what I'm thinking about is to still write about environmental, um, environmental economics, and I want to look at um, how the stringency of environmental regulations at the local level affect. Uh, economic growth and, and uh, economic performance um, because right now a lot of um, research for China is still done at a national level uh, assuming that you know 1.4 billion people act as a as a uh, you know s singular entity uh, and that misses a lot of these uh, you know differences between all the different provinces uh, within China uh, so I, I want to look at for example if province if a province adopts you know, tighter environmental regulations, um, can we assume that uh, this, this province's economy will be hit hard or would it actually drive economic growth in that uh, province? So you've been experienced in Canada, in China, in the United States. Uh, what are the things that we can learn from each other that is gonna, it seems that the, a lot of the issues that we deal with around the world and, and in our local communities are very much the same wherever you go in the world. What, what do you think of it that we can actually learn based on your experience from being quite involved in, in three different countries on the actions there? Definitely. I think uh, there, there are two trends I, I see. Um, either, either people you know, overestimate our, our, our differences or, or people uh, don't realize our differences. So between uh, Canada and the U.S. One one lesson that I learned very uh, quickly when I was studying in D.C. 
was that um, at first glance, uh, Canada and the U.S. are are so are so similar that when I was studying in D.C., I didn't feel like I was in a different country. Um, and that, but then I kind of realized that um, that it's it's the very small differences and the very small ways that how we act differently uh, that that really st stood out for me. Um, and then in, in China, I think a lot of people have this, um, ha, um, are, are still trying to like figure out, um, hmm, <laughs> are, are still, I don't know how to word this. Hmm. What are the small differences you saw between Canada and the US? Well, I don't know if this is something I, I don't know, it, it's just, it's such a sensitive topic, but, but to be honest, the, the first thing I can think of is race, yeah. uh, because people talk about race very differently in America, uh, especially right now, yeah. uh, you know, with all the tensions going on. And I'm not trying to say that Canada doesn't have instances of racism or that, you know, we're, we're doing perfect in terms of, you know, our, our racial policies, but at the same time, it's, I just feel really lucky to be living in Canada because, you know, ob objectively, we're doing so much better than our neighbors in the South. And I think that that's a, that's a huge difference. Yeah. And I think that's one that becomes more apparent in, in this pandemic time. What, what are the, you talked a little bit about the difference between uh, in, in China as well. Is there some specifics that come out in terms of how things are, are different? And my experiences in China, having been there a number of times, was I thought that everyone I met with was most congenial and supportive and friendly and positive and having uh, didn't see much difference in terms of what it is in, in a local area. Uh, but obviously the, the macro position of, of China, and you highlighted some of the challenges between uh, China and, and the United States. What what do you think in terms of the actual the, the people that are living there? How are, how are they seeing and interpreting that? I think um, China feels very ambivalent about the U.S. Especially especially the people um, who are well educated. Um, at one at one case, um, I think Chinese people very really admire um, the U.S. model and and an extension of that would be the Western model that Canada is part of, right? It, Chinese people think that uh, we have a lot to, to learn from, from this um, and that a lot of these goals are, are universal and, and that should be done. But at the same time, I, I think that there's a, there, there's a sense that China needs to do things very differently. Um, and I think that it's, it's this nationalistic sentiment that's right now really overblown. Um, and it's quite unfortunate what's happening right now in China. And as you finish your master's degree, you're planning to go on and get a, a doctorate and hoping to go to Cambridge. So what are, what are the experiences you're going to take from Canada and uh, your experiences at Georgetown and China into a, into a doctoral program? Do you have a, a focus in terms of your studies there? Definitely. I, I still want to do environmental economics. I, I just, I think that you know, one of the things that COVID really taught me was the vulnerability of our society. I mean, if one year ago you, you say that, you know, with all our technological progress and, and our, you know, political system that our society could be so vulnerable to a single virus, um, that would be quite unimaginable. But I think that, you know, look at what COVID has done um, to our society and, and grinding our economy to the, to a, um, to a complete stop. That's what climate change will be doing in the long term as well, except that COVID, we can come up with a vaccine really quickly and, and solve the situation. But for climate change, there's no easy solution. And it's going to take a long term, you know, couple of generations to be able to really figure out that balance. Um, and so we, we need to start now and, and we need to really think smart about it. I think one of the things I, I really noticed was how you know, climate change and environmental economics is just talked about differently in China, in North America, and in Europe. Um, I think in North America, we, we kind of understand that 
um, we have to make a decision between environment and uh, economic growth. Um, but we kind of tend towards economic growth and we're trying to see, okay, given that we want 2% growth every year, what are some of the environmental regulations that we, we can allow? In Europe, they're doing things completely differently though. I, I, and I think that that's the direction that we should be going where you're asking the question, you know, we, th these are the environmental regulations that we must have as a society. You know, given that, how do we drive economic growth? And I think that in, in China, um, the narrative is still lag lagging a bit, um, especially since I was talking to one of the you know, professors of environmental economics, and, and she's the first one in the country um, to, to kind of study environmental economics. Um, and she was saying that it's, when she was doing it, a lot of people just didn't really understand because environmental sciences in China traditionally was, a, was an engineering field. And people were just interested in, okay, well, you know, we, we need to build a dam that generates electricity. What are the, you know, um, what are the physics behind it? And people kind of study it from this perspective. And when she started in the 1980s, um, and from an e economic perspective, people were not understanding it, but then now people are still slowly looking at, at, at this. And so China still has a lot to catch up, but I, I, just, I think that it, it's a country with tremendous potential and it, you know, it's, it's got such a big economy that it will catch up quickly and it will develop its own narrative. So COVID that is influencing the whole world, do you see an opportunity coming out of a crisis like COVID that, uh, that is going to actually contribute to the kind of things you're saying? And most crises there's a, comes with an opportunity and whether or not we take that opportunity and look at it, not just for an economic revival, but also looking at it in terms of a, a social environmental uh, approach to, to doing things. Do you see some opportunity that uh, is fitting as a result of the crisis we're going through? Absolutely, yeah. I, I think that, you know, COVID has really offered that pause um, in, our, in our life to really think about the important issues um, that we're facing. And I think that before there might be an excuse saying that, well, you know, we, we don't want to damage our economy, you know, we don't, we don't really have time to implement all this. But I think that right now it's, it's really the best time to be implementing a lot of the changes that, that we want, uh, you know, in terms of our environmental uh, policies, in terms of how we position ourselves economically, uh, but also in the range of social issues, right, in terms of thinking about how our society should be run, what's the, what's the role of, you know, police in our society, how do we talk about race, and I think that these are all the things that COVID um, is giving us in, in the form of, you know, chaos right now, but really it's, it's a blessing to be able to have this time to reflect on it. Uh, if we look back over, uh, certainly in North America over the past century, there have been a number of crises and not, not many of them have actually taken advantage of the crisis. Sometimes it's just been pulling it economically. And so uh, hopefully you and others and all of us can be involved in saying, as we come out of this, let's make sure that we're actually making a difference. Medicare in Canada, the medical system came out of a crisis after World War II, uh, but not many other positive things have grown out of it. So I like the position you're taking and hopefully we can all be active in terms of being able to address that and the strategies coming out of it. Of course, thanks. If, uh, if you had the magic wand of some sort and you'd be able to make a, make a difference uh, in the world and had the power to wave that, what, what would be one or two of the most important things you'd wave that wand at? Yeah, um, I, I'm going to be very nerdy um, and, and stick <laughs> to my own uh, major. I, I think it's still uh, renewable energy. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I think in, within renewable energy, I'm, just, I'm still very passionate about um, nuclear energy. I, I, I think that you know, a lot of people do not like it, um, especially because of the disaster in Japan in 2011 and because Chernobyl and, and because all, all the things associated with it. But if you look at the facts, um, we simply cannot reach our, our goals of the uh, you know, Paris Climate Agreement if we don't adopt nuclear energy. So it's not, it's, it's not a matter of um, whether or not nuclear energy is good or evil. It, it's just that if we want to, achieve our climate goals, we have to adopt it. 
Um, and I think that honestly, I, having studied abroad, I think British Columbia is on the right track and we're just doing so well. I mean, we like over 90% of our energy, uh, our electricity comes from renewable sources. And if you look at the world, that's just, you know, awe-inspiring for, for most economies around the world. Um, and we have a big green presence over here um, in terms of thinking how we can incorporate sustainability into our economic development. And I, I think that's just brilliant. Um, and I'm really happy to be living here and, and, and to be part of this. Well, Canada is a, is a country with uh, all, we're all immigrants with the exception of the Indigenous First Nations people. And uh, so we all have come with uh, background and interest from all over the world. And I think that's one of the, the great blessings of Canada it is so multicultural and benefits from the, the experiences of generations and people from all over the world and the commonalities that we have and can honor and respect the sameness that we bring to it and, uh, and move forward in a positive way. So, and if we're gonna, we, we need to grow and we need, to, we need more people, we need more immigrants. We need to make sure that we're able to do that. And certainly, uh, Gary, you and your family have made enormous contributions to, to our community, to our province and our country. And uh, I look forward to getting to go through your dissertations as they come along. And I'm sure our country is much better because of you and your family. So thank you very much for being a part of Community Connections and for helping inform us. And so we're, we're a little smarter, a little wiser as a result of your experiences and what you've been able to bring. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today on Community Connections. Please tune in to our next show as more amazing people share their wonderful stories. If you haven't already, please click on the red subscribe button below, right down there, and view our updates. Feel free to leave any thoughts or comments that you may have. We're always trying to do a better job of connecting this wonderful people. Thanks again for joining, and until next time, Keep connecting. Thank you. Gordy Hogue, and this is Community Corrections. Let's start again. It's connections. I was just dealing with corrections. <laughs>